scripture reading for this morning comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 32. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him as he was teaching. And they asked, what kind of authority do you have for doing these things? Who gave you this authority? And Jesus replied, I have a question for you. If you tell me the answer, I'll tell you what kind of authority I have to do these things. Where did John get his authority to baptize? Did he get it from heaven or from humans? Now, they argued amongst themselves, if we say from heaven, he'll say to us, then why didn't you believe him? But we can't say from humans because we're afraid of the crowd since everyone thinks John was a prophet. Then they replied, well, we don't know. Jesus also said to them, neither will I tell you what kind of authority I have to do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. Now he came to the first and he said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. No, I don't want to, he replied. But later he changed his mind and went. The father said the same thing to the other son, who replied, Yes, sir, but he didn't go. Which one of these two did his father's will? And they said, The first one. Jesus said to them, I assure you that tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you on the righteous road, and you didn't believe him, but tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. Yet even after you saw this, you didn't change your hearts and lives, and you didn't believe him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, there are a few better ways to be reminded of the fleeting nature of time than to have kids. Um, our son Brooks is less than two months old, and he already looks so different than he did the day we met him. Um, there's this funny thing about newborns is right when they come out for like the first 24 to 48 hours, whether they're a boy or a girl, most of them look like cranky old men. Um, but then they pack on a few ounces, not even pounds, just a couple ounces. They kind of fill out a little bit, and then they don't look so much like cranky old men anymore, and they also don't feel quite as breakable anymore. And then, you know, another couple of weeks go by, and they don't really look like newborns anymore. They look like babies, and that's where we are now. We have a baby boy, six and a half weeks old. And we're so grateful to have one kid, much less two now, uh, but unless God has some weird Abraham and Sarah plan down the road, this is it, we're done. And... Um, that means there's no more wrinkly old, cranky old men, at least until maybe we have grandkids. Or I, I just become one, that's about, you know. <laughs> and even with Auden, she's now five and a half years old, and you all know this because you, you didn't see her for like the five weeks that I was out. I swear every time I blink, she's an inch taller. And every week she's a foot taller. And every time we turn around, she's more mature than she was the last time we talked to her. And then we're reminded every once in a while that she's five and you deal with that. But, there's a saying that people like to say to parents that the days are long, but the years are short. And that's true, but also sometimes the days are short, <laughs> right? When you, when you have a job, and you have kids, and you're trying to take care of yourself, and you're trying to sleep, and you're trying to watch college football, which at this point, what's the point anymore? <laughs> it just flies by. And look, paternity leave was awesome. It's a blessing. I, can t I, cannot, I cannot say thank you enough. Eventually, I'll stop saying thank you, but thank you for letting me do that. But if I look back on it, I do have one regret, and that was the amount of time I spent on my phone. Um, this is a common problem for a lot of us. I know it's a problem for me. I, I've known for a long time. Back when I worked in college campus ministry, every once in a while, students like to be funny, and they would dress up as me for Halloween, and that included holding a phone. So I know I have a problem. And look, I had plenty, I had plenty of one-on-one -on -one time with Brooks, and, and it was wonderful. But there will also be those moments where, like, I'm holding him, and then suddenly I'm looking at my phone, and I don't remember having grabbed my phone. Anyone have moments like that? Your hand just kind of moves away. And then sometimes I would consciously move, because he would fall asleep, and then I'd be like, well, I mean, I've looked at him. If he looks, yeah, he's there, you know? And I, I just, I'm, when I have constant inputs in my life. I struggle with the spiritual disciplines of of silence and solitude. I always have a podcast going or music going or, or I'm always scrolling social media trying to find another uh, fact for a sermon or a sermon illustration or a joke or that's how I keep up with the space program. I love the space program and I get it almost exclusively, you know, from social media. And so uh, once I've looked at Brooks for like 90 seconds, my brain is like, okay, what's next? And so sometimes I'm scrolling and then you lose track of time and you look down and, and you see these big eyes and moon pie face and you just wonder how long has he been looking at me looking at something else? And I start to feel guilty. And I'm, I'm trying not to beat myself up 
because I know I'm not scarring him for life. It's not like he's going to go to a therapist and be like, I don't know, the first four weeks my dad was looking at his phone and it was awful. <laughs> and uh, sometime next year, probably during Lent, we're going to do a, a sermon series on regret. But today isn't really about looking backward. But I want to talk more about taking advantage of the moment and the opportunities that we have right now. How can we set ourselves up for success? And, you know, so, so for me that meant like if I'm going to hold Brooks, the phone goes in another room where I can't reach it, you know? And then I don't have a chill. Like, set yourself up for success. Take advantage of the opportunities that you have right now. How can you set yourself up to succeed in those opportunities tomorrow? How can we be more present in the way that God is calling us to be more present? And our scripture from Matthew 21 is here to help us. And so to um, orient ourselves, this is toward the end of the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And at the end of the week, Jesus is going to be crucified. He's going to die, and then he'll rise again. But this is, this is where we are. This is the point in time. And our scripture opens with Jesus and his disciples entering the temple first thing in the morning. And then it says the chief priests and the elders came to listen to him teach, and Jesus is teaching. And that might sound like a pretty normal interaction, because it's kind of what has happened a bunch. Like, Jesus is a teacher and preacher and a miracle worker, so that's what he's going to be doing. And if he's in Jerusalem, might as well do it at the temple. And if he's doing it at the temple, then the people who have been kind of suspicious of him the whole time are going to keep an eye on him. That sounds all normal until you realize this is actually the day after what we call Palm Sunday, or the triumphal entry. This is not a normal morning. What happened the day before? Jesus, this guy that's basically been a thorn in their side, like a gnat buzzing around them the whole time, has ridden into the city on a donkey, and everyone that's there for Passover is treating him like a coming king. They're literally treating him the way they would treat the Roman emperor if the emperor came to visit. They're shouting, Hosanna, which means save us now. They're calling him the son of David. You know who the son of David is? It's the Messiah. They're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord in the eyes of the crowd. Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. He's not just some miracle worker. He's just not some good preacher. He is the Messiah. He is God's, like, presence sent to the temple for the first time in nearly 600 years. They are pinning all of their hopes and all of their expectations on him. And yes, some of those hopes and expectations are a little misguided. They want a military and and political messiah to kick out the Roman Empire so that they could just rule themselves. But Jesus didn't come just to do that. He came to free us from something much bigger and deeper and more pervasive, the power of sin and death. But can you see how this would grate on the religious leaders who are working with the Roman Empire to try to at least keep the temple open. They're like, what? No, don't, no, we're not starting any wars. We're not looking. We're in charge. We, we've kept this thing running. Why, why are you guys suddenly following this guy? And, and Jesus rides in, and he goes immediately to the temple, and who knows what he does as soon as he gets there? He throws out all the money changers. That's how they funded the ministry. And let me tell you, someone that leads a ministry that, re- that needs funding, it's kind of important to fund your ministry. And, but Jesus comes in, no, 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 none of this is okay. None of the, get out, get out. He acts like he's in charge of the temple. And then he starts to teach and preach. He basically holds court. Some of the commentators I read this week said that this is basically an occupation. Imagine if suddenly someone walked in from the back and said, Dan, step aside, I'm in charge now. I mean, that's kind of what it's like. And the day winds down, Jesus leaves for the night, but he has the audacity to come back in the morning and just pick up right where he left off. This isn't a one-time thing. This wasn't a stunt. Jesus really seems to think that he is in charge and has the authority to direct what's going on at the temple. And so we might not have picked up on it when we read it through the first time, but it says the chief priests and the elders of the people came, not a representative of. They all came. Whatever ancient version of text messages went out that night, guys, we got to show up in the morning. Someone bring coffee, someone bring donuts. we got to be ready. They all come. Now, they all come in part to show a united front. Like, hey, we, we, this is us, that's you, we're against you. But also, you know what's going on? They are about to ask him a question, and they want a bunch of witnesses. Because they know at some point, something's going to go down. And we're going to need witnesses. And if we're all here, and all the leaders, everyone that's had authority can say what he said, we got him. We've nailed him. So they ask him this question, what kind of authority do you have for doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Question about their question, is this an honest question? Do they actually care what Jesus' answer is? Are they genuinely curious? 
Are they open to considering and thinking and praying over Jesus' answer? Is there any realm in which anything Jesus says is going to change their mind? I don't think so. They're setting a trap. They're not asking an honest question. And it hit me this week that this question they asked Jesus is quite possibly one of the most central questions we have to wrestle with in our life of faith. When Jesus claims authority in our life, or when we say that Jesus has authority in our life, and then Jesus calls us to do something, or Jesus starts doing something that doesn't align with what we want to do, do we say, okay, yes, sir, or do we say, who gave you that authority? I mean, especially in today's culture and in today's world, right? You know, on one side of the argument, you've got just be you, do whatever feels good, do what's right, don't let anyone tell you what to do. And on the other side, you've got this is my wall, leave me alone. I won't bother you, you won't bother me. I'm in control of my own life. That's, that's pervasive in our culture from all sides of things. And so when the question is, who should guide our steps, Jesus or us? What's the obvious answer? Jesus. But what's the answer in practice? I mean, we're all here. And we just prayed, the, or we just said the Apostles' Creed, we call Jesus our Lord. A little bit later, we'll pray the Lord's Prayer, where we say, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that includes me. Um, later, we'll have an invitation, a confession, and a pardon, and we'll all pray about how we didn't do this week, what God called us to do, individually and collectively. We'll ask for forgiveness, we'll rededicate, we'll rededicate ourselves to doing what God wants us to do. And then at the end, we'll do a benediction, where I invite you to go in peace, to love, and to serve God in the world around you. We, we are here because we all say that Jesus guides our steps, but let me ask you, when was the last time you recognized that what Jesus wanted and what you wanted were different? And when that happened, how did that turn out? Who won out there? And perhaps even the harder question is, can you even remember the last time that happened? If you can't consciously think of a time where what you wanted and what Jesus wanted were different, one of two things is going on. Either, number one, you're perfectly in line with God's will, and that's awesome. Keep growing in your discipleship, being close to God. That's what we're supposed to be doing, shaped in God's love, shaped in God's wisdom, learning how to make the right steps and make the right decisions. But there's the other option, and that is perhaps we're not holding up what we want against what God wants, and we're just going with what we want, assuming that we have the right answer. I don't like preaching this because I struggle with this. And now notice how Jesus responds. Well, I have a question for you. You tell me the answer to my question, and then I'll tell you why I have the authority to do these things. You notice Jesus has no interest in entertaining a, a question asked in bad faith. Jesus is just not interested in having that conversation. So side note, life hack, maybe we don't have to entertain bad faith questions either. But that's a TED Talk. This is a sermon. So Jesus says, okay, how about this? Let, let's, let's set that aside. Let's talk about something else. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on. Where did John get his authority to baptize? John the Baptist. Y'all remember him. That crazy guy. Ate honey, wore animal skins, baptized a bunch of people. Then he got beheaded. Did he get his authority from heaven, from God? Or from humans? Because he was this charismatic figure and, and a lot of people liked. He was just really popular. He was like an influencer. And they argued amongst them. You can see them like step away to another corner of the temple. And they argued amongst themselves. Well, if we say from heaven, then he'll say, then why didn't you believe him? But we can't say from humans because we're afraid of the crowd since everyone thinks John was a prophet. And so they replied, we don't know. Is that an honest answer? No, that's no more of an honest answer than their question was an honest question. Did any of that argument actually call to mind what they actually believed? Did they discuss at all whether they thought John's authority was from heaven or from humans? No, not once. What were they debating? What's the right answer that gets us out of this? What's the right answer that preserves our authority? What's the right answer that helps us get rid of Jesus? They didn't once even talk about what they actually thought or believed. And uh, even more interesting is like, you know, if we say he's from God, then it proves that we aren't paying attention to God, so maybe we shouldn't be in charge. But if we say from humans, then we're going to lose the crowd, and a leader without a crowd is just someone taking a walk, right? So they decide to, to duck it and say, we don't know. And Jesus is like, well, then I'm not answering your question either. Obviously, we're not interested in having a real conversation. 
We're now halfway through our passage, and let's pause and just think what might our takeaways be. Have you ever felt like you're struggling to connect with Jesus? I know I have. These guys were, and they were guys, these guys were struggling to connect with Jesus as well. Was their problem access to Jesus? No. Jesus was right there, ready and willing to talk to them. What was holding them back from connecting with Jesus? Their attitude, their approach, their perspective, what they wanted to get out of it, what they were trying to protect, what they were trying to hold back from Jesus' authority. When I struggle with connecting to Jesus, I can blame it on access. I don't have time to pray, or when I pray, it doesn't feel like I hear anything. But what is it usually? It's that other thing, isn't it? Does that hit home for anybody other than me? And and again, I don't like, this is not fun. This is not the most fun sermon to preach. But I also don't think that any sermon ends with bad news, because the gospel is the good news. And so I think we actually get the good news here when we move on to the parable that Jesus tells. He says, well... What do you think? A man had two sons. And now he came to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. Now for us, that just sounds like the beginning of a nice little folksy story. But this is loaded with symbolism. Like if you're a fan of the Bible Project like I am, some of that might rang some bells for you or if, if you're like into Bible study. But let me tell you, this is not a conversation about a father and a son in a vineyard. In the Bible, when you hear stories about fathers and sons, that is a story about God and the nation of Israel. And particularly, there's two sons here. How many of you know Bible stories about two sons who are constantly opposites of one another or fighting with one another or one is doing God's will and one isn't, right? This is a repeated pattern. And working in a vineyard isn't just like, a, oh, and they had like a little agro turismo and they bring in little, little farm-to-table vineyard. All throughout the Old Testament, the image of working a vineyard is the image of the leaders of Israel whose task it is to cultivate the nation of Israel. The people whose job it is to watch over and bear fruit, be fruitful and multiply. So this is not a conversation about an actual father and two sons in a vineyard. This is a conversation about the people who have been called to lead the nation of Israel and whether they're actually doing it or not. A man had two sons, and now he came to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. No, I don't want to, he replied. But later, he changed his mind and went. The father said the same thing to the other son, who replied, Yes, sir, but he didn't go. Which one of these two did the father's will? And they said, The first one. Why do you think they were grumbly? Why do you think they said it under their breath? Because they recognize who Jesus is accusing them of being. Right? They are the ones who have signed up to lead the nation of Israel, right? They're the ones who have said, Yep, I'll do it. I'm a high priest. I'm an elder of the people. They're the ones that give the right answer. But Jesus is implying you can have the right answer, but doing God's will is is another step beyond. Right? Jesus turns everyone's expectations on their heads. In Jesus' view, the leaders who said they would do God's will actually aren't. And the people who have famously rejected God are now coming to God and following through in the end. And Jesus goes ahead and spells it out. He says, look, I assure you that tax collectors and prostitutes are entering God's kingdom ahead of you. For John came to you on the righteous road, and you didn't believe him. But tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. Yet, even after you saw this, you didn't change your hearts and lives, and you didn't believe him. What did John the Baptist and Jesus witness throughout their ministry? They witnessed people who had all the right answers, but used all those right answers to actually create a distance between them and God. And then they found all the people who had maybe consciously rejected God, but then come back. Or people who had never felt welcome in the family of God, who found in John or found in Jesus a welcome and came and responded to that invitation. To Jesus, what ultimately matters, whether we have the right answers or whether we do the right thing? Now, it's not that we earn God's love by doing the right thing. That's not it at all. But when we do the right thing, it's usually because it is the fruit of having a loving and close and guiding relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We tie this into the the first half of today's story. 
We can call ourselves Christians. We can come to worship. We can profess our love for Jesus. We can say he's our Lord and Savior. We can talk about how important prayer is. But what happens if when we leave this place, we do the equivalent of scrolling on our phones while the newborn is staring at us? Friends, God is closer to you than Brooks was to me right here in my arms. And God doesn't sleep. And God doesn't stare off into the distance while eating a bottle. God is constantly looking at you with those big eyes and that welcoming face. And here's the thing. I know from my own practice and from getting to know some of you that when we have been away from prayer or away from worship or away from studying the scriptures, or away from connecting in a life group, and we feel like that's something we should do, sometimes we stop and don't actually do it because we feel guilty about not having done it. And the longer you go without doing it, the more guilty you feel. And we begin to worry that when we finally come back to God, when we finally come to prayer, God's going to say, what took you so long? How many of you have honestly like worried about that? Where what if... What God is waiting to say is, I've been waiting on you, and you're here. Let's do it. Let's do it. In the Old Testament prophet uh, Ezekiel, he uh, gets tasked with speaking to the nation of Israel at a time in which they felt incredibly entitled. They thought because of who they were and who their dad was and what their tribe name was and where they were, that that they just deserved everything that they got. And Ezekiel has to go to them with this hard but hopeful message. He says, abandon all your repeated sins. Make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why should you die, house of Israel? I most certainly don't want anyone to die. This is what the Lord God says. Change your ways and live. God isn't waiting to condemn you. God is waiting to save you. God isn't waiting to kill you. God is waiting to give you life. God is there. The opportunity is there. And look, we all don't have time to sit in a fancy chair at four o'clock in the morning with a cup of tea and soft music and a prayer journal, although if you can do that, that's great. We don't, that's not, that's not going to be logistically possible for all of us. But doesn't the Bible also call us to pray without ceasing? It's almost as if there is a way to live our life and to do the things of life in a way where we've set our proverbial phone aside and are doing things with our focus in a certain direction. And when Jesus tells the religious leaders about the tax collectors and the prostitutes coming into God's kingdom, do you think Jesus was ashamed of them or do you think Jesus was proud of them? Jesus was proud of them. Jesus spoke of them with joy, and I seem to remember a a fairly famous parable about a shepherd with 99 sheep who are safe and one who is off in the distance, and God runs after that one. Oh, I spoiled it for you. The shepherd runs after that one and grabs that one and brings it back, and what do they do? Do they scold the one, or do they rejoice? And so perhaps what, what might help us start to open ourselves up to recognize and to enter into this connection with God that is always available to us is One of the prayers from the tradition of our church. And so I invite you now to enter into this prayer with me. And uh, we'll post it on social media later this week. So if it's meaningful to you, you can grab it and pray it in your own life. Let us pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us of those things which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.